This is Join Us in France, episode 215. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France, its many quirks, <clears throat> yes, we have a lot of them, its history, its language, and of course, itineraries and destinations in France you want to hear about because hopefully you'll be visiting soon. On today's episode, the Picardie with William Ciardello. William has visited parts of France that most of us never make it to, and this is our first time talking about the Picardie on the podcast. So, yay, finally! For my personal update, you'll hear Elise and I give you some advice on how to deal with the yellow jacket protests going on in December 2018. Things are calming down a bit, thankfully. And there won't be a new episode on December 30th or January 6th because I will be away enjoying family time. Join Us in France is brought to you by Patreon supporters and Addicted to France, the small group tour company for people who want to enjoy France to the fullest with zero stress. You can still check out our tour on the Dordogne coming up in September 2019 on addictedtofrance.com and I think that would make for a very nice Christmas gift. Welcome back to join us in France. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Annie. It's good the, to speak with you. The, lovely to speak with you again. Thank you so much for sticking with me and uh, talking to us about Picardy. For people who haven't listened to the first episode we recorded together, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to visit Picardy? Yes, Annie, I'm, I'm retired and I uh, spend one month every summer, the month of August, and I host uh, students that come to the New York area from France. I host one boy every, every August, uh, usually a teenager, anywhere between 14 and, and 18 years old. Uh -huh. And uh, I've done it now four years in a row. This last August was uh, my, my fourth person. And uh, I get to really bond very well with, with these boys. So I get well, to know yeah. them well. I correspond with their families about their experiences. And uh, I get invitations to um, to come and visit them and see where they live and, and meet their families. So that I've, so I've cool. done that. I've done that. And I've um, seen three of the four now uh, in France, met their families and spent time, a lot of time with their families who uh, who have just very graciously uh, offered their, their homes and their time uh, for me to, to do that. Well, it's fantastic because they take you around and you get to see, the, you know, France with locals. That's exactly fantastic. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. I think uh, not a lot of people get to do that. Yeah. So this 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 student, his name was is Paul. Uh, the family name is Brasset, B R A S S E T, and they live in a very small town in the uh, Picardy region of France called Flavie Le Matel, F L A V Y dash L E dash M A R T E L. Yeah, which I would say Flavie Le Martel. Yeah, that's how you would say. It. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say it like that. And and Paul is uh, Paul was with me in 2015. He was my second uh, second student. And Paul has a very very gracious, sweet personality. He, he's just a very calm, easygoing, very self aware young man. And and I, I just just so impressed with his personality. And when I met his mother and father, I knew I saw exactly where it came from because huh. it was, he's just a chip off the old, old block. Huh. And, and, and Paul is um, right now he, when he was here, he was 16. The day after he, he arrived here, he turned 17. So I was able to celebrate his 17th birthday with him. Cool. And he's now uh, in his second year at the University of Picardie Jules Verne in Amiens. Amiens. Nice. Amiens. 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 Yeah. Amiens. Amiens. And he's uh, there in the second year. And the program that he's in, he's 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 wants to become a chemist. Uh huh. 
and he is um, the first year the program he was in enrolled 1,100 students, and they only keep the first 350 after the oh, first wow. year. It's extremely competitive, and Paul finished number 80. So it gives you an idea of Break and and, and he said, and he said he spent this whole time his first first year doing nothing but studying and eating. So I kind of teased him because he gained <laughs> a little bit of weight. I said, you're not running, you're not exercising. And he said, that's all I could do was study and and, and eat. So it was very smart kid, very, very sweet kid. And his family is his mom and dad. And he's got a younger sister who is 16 years old. And her name is Ludmila. They named her after the Russian, I believe it was a Russian dancer, a Russian actress. Oh, nice. And they call her Lulu. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> that's a little easier. So, um, uh, what was what was interesting about my visit uh, the, there? I, I, I went to uh, arrived in Paris, spent four days in Paris because my partner Donnie had never been to Paris. I had been several times, so I wanted to give him a whirlwind of of some of the the the, the sights of Paris. Sure. And because Paul lives an hour and a half, basically northwest of Paris. I asked him if he would come down and spend the four days with us in Paris. And then I went on to Nice, to Corsica, came back to Paris. And then um, he and his dad picked me up and we went to Picardy for a week. So I got to see him twice. And it was really nice, again, an indication of his personality. When I outlined the trip to him in January uh, and, and I outlined it just like I said it, he texted me right back. He says, I get to see you twice. Oh, and how nice. Really, really, really sweet. So he came down and, and I had I had a map. I had a list of things to do each day. I had I had the site circled on the map. I gave him the map. I gave him the list. I said, you take care of it. So it was really nice to have a French <laughs> host. And his dad had given him a stack of metro tickets for the bus. And I had never used the bus system in Paris. Ah. And Paul had a pretty good idea of the bus system. And you could get to see so much more on the bus than the metro because it's above uh, above yeah. ground yeah and and it was it was it was really really nice uh and and <laughs> to have him and in fact it was a couple of times because he was speaking english to us you know again these 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 boys come here on an english immersion american culture program right so he was speaking english to, to us and at times we were in a restaurant to order for lunch or dinner and he he would speak to the the wait the waiter in english and mm -hmm the waiter would look confused and then all of a sudden he would transit transition to French. So it was, it was, it was interesting to watch, watch their interactions. <laughs> yeah. So we, we had, we had a little advantage of having him in Paris. So then uh, on, on the, um, I flew back from, from Corsica to uh, Orly. It's kind of interesting. The, the flights from, from Corsica to Paris, the, the flights to Orly were about $75. The flights yeah. to Charles de Gaulle were four hundred dollars. Oh my! And it's it's similar here that you can get some very inexpensive flights out of Kennedy Airport compared to Newark Airport, and and vice versa. And I, I don't know what the reason is for that. Yeah. So so when I when I was planning the trip in January, I booked the flights to Orly. Then I figured, okay, because Paul told me that there was a there was a train about an hour or so train ride from Charles de Gaulle. To a, a town uh, right next to the town he lives in, uh -huh. and I thought that would be really convenient. Then I looked at how to get from Orly to Charles de Gaulle, and it was a bus and a train and some walking. Yeah, and and I put it together and I wrote myself instructions, and I thought that this is very confusing. And when I wrote him <laughs> back, he texted me back. He said, "I spoke to my dad. We will pick you up at Orly." So oh, nice. <laughs> they were gracious enough to come down to Orly, which was a little bit further out for them. So the first yeah. day uh, was a Friday, and, and um, we got there about midday, and and uh, Paul and his dad uh, picked us up at, at Orly, and right away, Paul had picked out a restaurant near Paris, uh, in the suburbs of Paris, for, for lunch, so we had we had lunch there. Then his dad is a, um, is a farmer, and he owns two garden center nurseries, greenhouse operations, so it's... It's a it's a pretty extensive business that his mm. father runs, and and I, again like the last time I had no idea what to expect. I figured I'll spend a week with his family. I told Paul because he asked me what did I want to do, and I said, well, I see there's a lot of World War One history historical sites in, sure, yeah, and it's also close to the Champagne region 
of right. France. So maybe we could go down and see a champagne carve and 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 that. I said, but yeah. otherwise, you know, we'll just. I'm 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 very much interested in horticulture. Uh, I'm a certified master gardener. I'm I'm very much like to see how greenhouses are operated. I've never really been on a on a real farm before, so I'm I'm very much interested in 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 your dad's business and what your dad does, which oh. Paul has no interest in because it's a tough business. You know, they're up at four o'clock in the morning. They're they're at the uh, mercy of of the weather and the oh, economy. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, his sister is interested in the business, but Paul. Paul is is not, and 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 his parents are, are very much understand that, and his mother does sure. all the keeping for the business. They have a home office, that's uh, quite a quite an operation that 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 she she runs there. Hmm. So after lunch, his dad took us up to a town called Compiègne, C O M P I E G N E. Yes, Compiègne. And- Compiègne, and I, I didn't, I didn't know this, uh, but it, it was the site of the armistice that was signed uh, to stop the fighting of in World War One. Yes. And it's middle of middle of a forest in a clearing. There's, uh, it was chosen for the fact that it was a remote location, and it actually, it just, it, it just was to uh, was signed by the British, the Germans, and the French. Uh, by French Commander Foch in a railway carriage, and they have a recreation of that with the desk and the signers of the armistice there. And it was um, it was signed on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. So November 11th is Armistice Day. Yes. And you know, all my life I've heard of Armistice Day. I always knew it was the 11th month and the 11th um, day. I didn't yeah. realize that it was the 11th hour. It was 11 yeah. o'clock. In the morning. They, they went all so, out. Yeah, they, they 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 really really did. So I learned a little bit about that that history. And the Treaty of Versailles was signed six months later, which officially ended ended World War One. The other interesting thing was that we were there within days of the 100th anniversary of all of this, everything happening around about around the end of World War One in, in 1917. Hmm. So it was it was interesting to be there 100 years 100 years later. Yeah. So I got my first little taste of of of, of a World War One site in in that in that area and and the the topography of Picardy seems you know kind of rather flat it's a lot of a lot of farmland mm-hmm. they um they're putting up a lot of windmills oh. for uh, for electricity i mean a lot of windmills and paul's dad said that uh, they're putting them up on on farms and and they're just like gentle giants they just just turn in the in the breeze and he said that where his farms are the municipality, the local municipality, does not permit them. But it seems like every other municipality around there does because they, they, there's a lot of them going up. Yeah. Then it took us to a town called Piafon. It's yeah, a Piafon, very, yeah. very small town, about 2,000 people. And they wanted just to show us a typical, I guess, a typical French chateau. And the Chateau de Piafon is there. And when I... Google the history of it. I saw that it was completed in around 1407. So it's been there for a while. Long time, and it's famous. Yeah, you know, it's interesting history that it was partially destroyed, and it was a ruin for about 200 years. And Napoleon III wanted to restore it, so he saw to its re- restoration, and it was restored in kind of a not a a, 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 a true way so that it's outside of it is a medieval style and the inside is a renaissance style so but it's it's a it's a beautiful beautiful chateau and uh, and the town is very very nice we walked around the town for a, a little bit and then um it was time to uh, to go to go home so hmm. again we had we had just come from the airport we went to the armistice site then we went to Piafon, and then we drove to uh uh Flavie le martel uh, where that family lives, and the highways were were, were very very nice highways, uh, very very good shape um, compared to the winding roads and, and the narrow roads in, in, in a lot of Corsica. So uh, and, and it, I thought it was interesting that the uh, the tolls on the highway, you that Paul's dad, his name is Thibault, he would put a uh, a card like a credit card into the toll machine, and and then that's how they paid the toll. Whereas here we have the electronic uh, sensor that's picked up by a camera, and you just drive drive through. Yeah, I have an electronic sensor too. Yeah, so here I don't know. Maybe so maybe be. there's two there's two different methods. 
Yeah, there's got to be more. Yeah. But, but that was a little bit different. Yeah. To me. So, uh, again, when I when I planned the trip in January and I I wrote to Paul and I said, have you have your dad or you let me know, you know, where's a local hotel or someplace that'd be convenient for you to stay. The response was no way. We have a big house. You're staying with us. So yeah. they, they do have a fairly big house, a rambling house. I'd say maybe they have maybe three or four active bedrooms. They have some bedrooms that are closed off. Uh, I think at one time it was a big uh, a farmhouse. Most of it is on one story. Part of it is two stories. And it's um, it's their home and also the business. The business is, is a garden center, what we would call in the U.S. a nursery. Right. And it's they also use one of the big rooms in the house for their home office for their businesses because he also has greenhouses and, and, and farms. In in Picardy, so <clears throat> we had a, a very nice big bedroom, and uh, Donnie loved the fact of the, the the shutters in France that totally black out the yeah. room. So <laughs> I love light; he loves dark. So <laughs> he, he loved the way the way the setup was there. Match made in and, heaven, right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So they showed us the house, and behind uh, the the house was on a long narrow. Uh, piece of property and behind that is the garden center with the parking lot for the garden center mm-hmm. and it's a pretty extensive garden center they grow they grow vegetables the tomatoes the strawberries squash were in season when when we were there lettuce was still still coming up in fact paul had written to me he says i hope you don't i hope you don't mind eating fresh fruits and vegetables from our greenhouse and what? i said well, how would you well, mind well, yeah, they would mind that because the yeah. problem we have problem we have in the united states is we get we get uh, fruits and vegetables that have no flavor at all. They look beautiful, right. but they have no. Flavor. And 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 these these fruits and vegetables were amazing. So um, <laughs> they they showed us the house. They showed us the first uh, the first uh, the garden center behind us. It's called um, Cere de la Croissette, S E R R E S, which I think means greenhouses. Go- Cere, yes, yeah, Cere means greenhouse. Yes. Yeah, de la croisette, C R O I S E T T E. De la croisette, okay, sale de la croisette, very good. Yes, the name of the business, and and so it was the end of the spring season, and and it's interesting the the growing seasons in Picardy and where I live here seem to be about the same, and it was the end of the season there, it was the end of the season here, and the, the season ended very quickly there because they had just come off about a week long heat wave of 90 degree plus weather mm. and so so when it gets that hot people just get out of the mood of of spring planting because all yeah. of a sudden it's, it's summer and i understand it's very very unusual for it to get that hot that that far north and for that long in in in, uh, in france so the the greenhouse has you know all all the accoutrements of a of a of a like all greenhouses Normal, here yeah yeah and they had one section where they had the terroir de Picardie, where they have all of the uh, the local pâtés and confiture uh, and products uh, that are local to Picardy. And the then they have all the, all the plants. And, and a lot of the plants at this point, as, a, as the nurseries here, if they don't sell them, they start to heavily discount them because they have to get them out and get ready for the next season. Sure. And Thibault, Thibault looked at me and he says, in a couple of weeks, all of this is compost. <laughs> And and that's huh. just the nature of nature of that business. So huh. um, we had every morning, Tebow would go out and come back with a big bowl of the freshest, sweetest strawberries that I ever had in my life. And 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 having taken the master gardener's course, and strawberries are, are a good crop here in New Jersey, I learned that if you cut open a strawberry and there's white in the strawberry, it's not ready, and you shouldn't eat it. And and I don't think many Americans know that because most of our strawberries are are, are, are pink or white. <laughs> and these were red, rosy, beautiful, sweet strawberries that, you know, here we we dump sugar on them. There you eat them, you eat them like candy. Sure. And and Paul's grandmother, when Paul came to stay with me, he brought a jar of 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 uh preserves or confiture that his grandmother made that I guarded with my life because they were, they were just fantastic. <laughs> And 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 so we had plenty of that there. And and one Sunday, Paul's mom made a sorbet from the strawberries that I couldn't leave alone. It was it was just just an amazing. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so, we have uh, we have good um, we have good produce, and if it's fresh from their greenhouse, that's even better. Yeah, I mean, what we were eating was in the ground <laughs> that morning or that couple of hours earlier. Wow! So it's as fresh as fresh gets, and and all the meals we had there were were home cooked meals. And uh, I, I couldn't leave the salads alone. I just kept kept gobbling down the salads. And Paul's mom just had a big <laughs> smile on her face because I, I was I was just 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 loving it and the <laughs> tomatoes it was just so much. So then the next morning was a Saturday, and we were going to go out and look at a couple of two sites that were uh, World War One battle battle sites. Right. And again, again, an interesting history. I I, I think that, that that a lot of places, corners that you turn in France especially in that part of France, have so much historical context to them that that the, the little bit deeper that you dig, the more interesting things come out. And we went to a, a place called the Chemin, Chemin des Dames. The Chemin des Dames, yes. Chemin des Dames. And, and Paul's dad tried to explain it to me. And it was interesting that his, 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 his father... Uh, when I communicated with the family via email in the past, his mother would answer. And Paul said that that his mother understood English, but his father didn't. Um, but his father spoke well enough English that that he could easily be understood. And um, and and his, his mother as well. So his dad tried to explain to me what um, what this was. And I had a pretty good idea. But basically, it's a it's a it's a roadway that runs on a ridge. It's 30 kilometers between the the Ain River, A-I-S-N-E. Mm, let's see. A-I-S-N-E. I think it's oh, Lenne, Lenne. River and the uh, uh, Ailet River. Lenne so is A-I-L-E-T-E. A-I-L-E-T-T-E. Ailet. So there's those two rivers, and this road is is runs on a ridge between those rivers, and it was the 18th century route of two daughters of Louis the 15th, and they were called the Ladies of France, and and as I'm finding this out, I'm wondering well, what does this have to do with World War One? But anyway, you'll see. Direct uh, was a direct route between Paris and the Chateau de Beauve, which belonged to a former mistress of Louis the 15th. Ah, very important. And, and they had the road surfaced so it would be easier passage for the ladies of France. Uh, and then it was named the Chemin de Dame. Le Chemin de Dame, yes. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm thinking, again, I'm, I'm quizzical. All right. And it turned out that this ridge was a strate- was very strategic during many World War I battles yeah. because it offered a panoramic view of the valley. So and Paul's dad explained to me from different vantage points that the better view they had of the valley, the more strategic it was to plan the assaults or the defenses and the offenses of, of the battle. Yeah. So we went to a, a site called La Caverne du, Dra- du Dragon, du Dragon, the Dragon's Cave. La Caverne du Dragon? Yeah. Yeah. And this, this was a, a limestone quarry for three centuries. In this in this area, and it became an underground barracks during World War One. It's uh, 50, 15 meters or fifty feet into the ground, so you could take a tour. I think it's maybe eight euro to take a tour, and and every every so many hours they have a tour in English. Hmm. So we we took the the English tour, and the Germans occupied this this uh, this quarry. It was just a series of tunnels. That were carved out of the out of the limestone. They occupied it in 1915. They installed electricity, gun stations, a chapel, and a telephone because they they lived in they lived in it um, for many months. I forgot how many months, but for many months it was reca- recaptured by the French in 1917. So it was two years. And at times the Germans uh, were also in the same quarry as the French were. They were separated by walls, and. The the tunnels have dates and names carved into the walls by the soldiers that were there a hundred years ago. Wow! And they named it the Dragon's Cave because of the sparks and flames that came from the cave, looked like flames from the mouth of a dragon. Oh, okay. And and, and it was it was one of the most haunting sites I've been in because when you walk through it and it's extensive, it's probably a good hour, maybe hour and a half tour, and you go to rooms where they slept, where they ate, mm. uh, where they worked. And and where they died, where they were buried, where they were where they were, were healed. Wow. And they they would have um uh gas attacks into the into the tunnels. 
Wow. And so they had to live, live in, the, in the, the harshest kind of conditions. And um, you, 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 you just put yourself in, in the place oh, of yeah. these soldiers. Yeah, you think years about ago. that, yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm thinking that, you know, that, that sometimes we think we have hardships in our lives to think that how, how these men, you know, and, and no matter what side they were on, had to endure the hardships of a war yeah. like like that one was. So it was, it, was a, it was a very interesting day and very interesting time yeah. to see. And and that that part of the, 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 the country is just saturated with world war one history and historical sites so i think i saw i saw one of the one of the um, one of the more interesting ones um to 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 visit yeah this is not one i've seen but it's famous it's one that you hear about in the in the history books when you go to school in france so yeah in that afternoon we uh we actually shifted into something completely different. We drove down to Epernay in the Champagne region. Yeah, Epernay, yeah, nice. And so we learned a little bit about Champagne. I had been there many, many years before I was in, let me see if I can say that, I practiced so much to say the name of the town, um, Reims. Reims, almost. Right? Reims, Reims. <laughs> so to us it looks like it's Reims, but yes. I had been to the, the, the Tatanger, uh Champagne. Right, right. Uh, Cobb there well, many 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 in the, in the 70s so I wanted to go back uh, to see because because when they asked me what I wanted to do I said you know we'll, we'll go to a champagne place we'll look at some World War one stuff and that's fine and and and, and the horticulture so uh, Paul's dad had made reservations at the um, the champagne uh, de Castellan uh, uh, tour mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the big uh, producers uh, and, and and bottlers there sellers And they, not one um, that's famous, as famous as uh, well, Tatanger. Or... When when we were on the tour, the, the tour guide asked us where we were from, and there were people from Britain and Australia, and we were the only Americans. And she says, "Well, we were available in Britain and Australia, but not in the United States." Right. Because I had never heard of the brand, but it seems like it's a prominent brand there. And the t the town of Epernay is built on chalk rock, where the champagne is bottled and it's stored. And there's a big tower that they have. It's 216 feet high, and they have uh, 16 six. I'm sorry, six kilometers of cellar. So we we did the tour and we did the wine tasting, and that that finished off um, that day of of touring. Went home to a, to another home cooked meal and more fresh salad and tomatoes and mm. and Paul's dad is uh, loves cheese. And uh, he bought some fresh baguettes. I had to take a picture. I, I walked to the boulangerie with him that morning, and I, he had a couple of baguettes in his arms. I had him turn around. I said, I have to take a picture of a Frenchman with his baguettes. And I treasure, I treasure that picture. So um, so we, we ended up – and again, almost like, like Luca's dad, um, Paul's dad, Thibault, at the end of the evening – Uh, after the uh, the cheese course, he had five or six different kinds of cheese. So I learned a little bit more about cheese, and I, I love cheese. Yeah. We uh, we would go to the uh, the sitting room, and then he would take out the cognac and the different uh, the different uh, liqueurs, and <laughs> we would have a couple of shots. So it was it was just 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 a very nice uh, family um, kind of a thing. Very nice. So the next day was a Sunday, and. Uh, Uh, Paul's uh, cousins came in from Bordeaux. Ah. They, uh, they were a couple about my age. I'm in my, my mid 60s. And they had just returned from a trip to New York. And um, I just, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a greeter uh, at the uh, High Line Park in, in New York, which is a linear elevated park made, made uh, on, on an old rail, railway. Mm. Uh, similar to the uh, Promenade Plante in Paris, which I think was, was one of the. Um, yes. The, for it. And I did see that when I was in Paris. So I, I am a greeter there. So I'm, I'm very familiar and I love the High Line. So instead of asking him, hey, had you been to the World Trade Center or the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty? I said, I said, did you visit the High Line? He said, oh, I absolutely love the High Line. So we had a really nice conversation uh, about that and, and, and his, and his, uh, his visit, uh, their visit to New York City. Nice. And Paul's uh, dad took us on a, a tour of the greenhouse And they showed us how they they pot they were in the process of potting chrysanthemum seedlings. Now this was in June. Chrysanthemums are now a big seller at this time of the year, so they were getting ready right. for, the, October, for the fall September, season. September, yeah. 
right? And they showed us the greenhouses that were full of tomatoes and strawberries. And I just absolutely loved it. And Paul's <laughs> grandparents came. They came up. They don't live too far away. So I got to meet his grandmother and his grandfather on his father's side. And that day, that Sunday, the uh, the family had been invited to a town function. There was a was the 60th birthday for one of the town luminaries. I remember it's a small town, and this man was a very popular man in the town. I don't know if he was a politician or, or, or what his status was, but he right. was very well known in the town. So they had rented out a a, um, a a field next to a church. It's actually a field that Paul and his sister used to play in during like a summer camp when they were younger. And they put up tents and they had a band and food and mm-hmm. punch table set up. And, and Paul's family was invited. So they they took us along um, and we met we met this man and we met uh, we met a lot of people who were very gracious. Um, I'd probably say half of them could speak some English and the ones that couldn't still were, were very nice and very gracious. Hmm. And everybody wanted to meet the Americans. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I want to meet the Americans. So. It was June 25th, which is the same birthday, the same day uh, as my partner's birthday, Donnie's birthday. Yeah. And when the people at the uh, function found out, and there were, there were probably about a good maybe 75 people there. When they found out it was his birthday, they had the band, it was live music, they had the band sing Happy Birthday in English. Oh, how nice. <laughs> and and I, I, I tease him. I said, I said, how many people do you know that a whole town comes out and sings happy birthday to you for your <laughs> birthday? So I was able, was able to capture part of it on, on video. But, That's great. But, but I started realizing what was going on. So it, it was really, really nice. We got to talk to a lot of people and, and it was a very, very enjoyable afternoon. And it's 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 a slice of, of small town France that and I never would have experienced um, had I oh, not. Oh, yeah not done that (laughs) so the next day was monday we went to amiens yes amiens yep amiens and uh, i said paul goes to goes to college there Mm -hmm. and they wanted to show us the the uh the cathedral basilica of our lady of amiens which is a huge cathedral it's the 19th largest church in the world and the second largest in France in area at 7,700 square meters, which is about 83,000 square feet. Oh, that's big. And it was built between 1220 and 1270. I think mm-hmm. the Cologne Cathedral is big when you measure it in area, not, not by height. And um, Paul and his dad were fond because they said it a couple of times, telling us that the Cathedral Notre Dame in Paris could fit inside the cathedral in Amiens. And um, Amiens is about um, an hour and a half away. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's, it's like it's a university town. It's a bigger city, 135,000 people. It looks like a very, very nice city that's got some some diversity. It looks like restaurants and a uh, very nice train station. And and uh, Paul went to uh, boarding school there for high school. And then last year he spent his first year at, at the University of Picardy. And now he's in his second year there. And the family had, had rented an apartment for him right. to stay there. And every, few weekends he would he would take the train to 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 uh to home and this year his dad as an investment decided that he would buy an apartment uh mm-hmm. so paul could spend the rest of his university uh time in in this apartment and then afterwards he would have it as an investment yeah and he also bought, a, bought another small apartment so the apartment that paul has is really nice it's a it's a it's like a loft it's a small apartment in an older building, but it's the outside looks old. The inside is is all modernized, mm-hmm. and so he's got a loft. Underneath the loft is is a bathroom. In front of the bathroom is is a kitchen, which is 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 below, and on level with the uh, first floor is the living room in front. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's a perfect setup for a single person or especially a student. Yeah. So we. we um, Paul and his dad bought some pates and some bread, and so we sat around the table and some wine, and we had we had a nice lunch in in Paul's new apartment. And then That's he had a very had, French thing to do, by the way. And French, it was very nice. It yeah, was very nice. I French, absolutely loved it. French people, when they send their kids to college, will often buy an apartment. At least the ones that are a little better off, you know, they uh-huh. will buy an apartment and then rent it out. It's kind of an investment for retirement. I actually looked into doing that for my daughter. Uh, she's just going to Toulouse, but I thought, well, why not? If I find a nice place. So the problem is 
The prices they have to pay the rent anyway. So right, they have to pay the rent anyway. But the prices have gone up so much in downtown Toulouse that you'd ha I'd have to charge a lot of rent to make it worth oh. it. So I decided, you know, financially it doesn't make any sense. But but in a lot of towns in France, it does make sense. You know, it's it's something that a lot of French people do. Yeah, he actually bought two apartments. Yeah, and we had to go to the other one to leave a key with someone because he had just just um, rented it to tenants. And uh, so I got to see the other one was a one bedroom apartment, more traditional flat on the ground floor of a more more modern building. Mm -hmm. So he, he he decided to go and invest in, in two apartments. And yeah. then um, then because of my interest in horticulture, there's a very interesting nature preserve near the center of the city of Amiens is called uh, Des Ortillonnages. Ortillonnage, des ortillonnage. Des ortillonnage. I can't even say it. <laughs> and 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 it's a it's, it's a nature preserve, and they have a 45 minute electric gondola ride that, that goes through the canals, and and uh, electric I, I never, gondola. What is that? It's it's a little gondola. It seats probably about 10 people, and they have a man that stands up with a paddle that kind of guides it, and it has a tiny electric motor on it. That helps the, the 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 gondolier, I guess, or the guy who paddled the uh, the go the gondola. Hmm. So it, it moves forward, and I think he mainly paddles it to to steer it. Huh? He stands up, and then he gives a a, uh, a narration of what, what we're seeing. And they didn't have any English ones; it was all in all in French. And the man had a had a, had a, a very unique voice. Some things I could understand, and apparently he was a humorist. Because every once in a while, Paul or his dad would explain to me what he just said, and some of the humor I didn't understand, and they would say, "Well, you know, you have to have the the, the French sensibility to understand." The, yeah, yeah, the, the French sense of humor, which is very different from American sense of humor. Yeah, and then when we when we got off the boat, and he found out we were Americans, he the, the guy he thought it was was it was fantastic that he had a, he had a couple of Americans on his on his boat. <laughs> but but it's it's an it's interesting. It probably was yeah, forty five minutes long. Uh, it's a slow, it's a slow boat ride, mm -hmm. and you see very whimsical cottages and gardens, and and, and uh, it's it's nothing that's formal or structured. It's it's either natural or or people just have some some whimsical things like big wooden ducks or different defollies that they put in their gardens. And part huh. of it is is a nature preserve. Part of it is looked like it was it was private property. Huh. But it, it, was, it was very interesting, and I was able to identify a lot of plants and flowers. So so I, I was happy about that. So that and then you know we, and earlier in the day we had toured the the cathedral and we spent um, a good hour in the cathedral. And uh, took a lot of pictures. It's just just a very very beautiful beautiful church. I know a, a lot of times when you go to Italy or France, you get church fatigue or cathedral fatigue. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time, but this one we really really devoted a few hours to, and and it was was well worth it because it was so big. And there were a lot of times we the four of us were in four different parts of the church where we couldn't see each other. Right. But, we but you just wanted up. to look at different things. Right, you finally ended up together. So it's, it's definitely if anybody's up in that part of of the of the country, I think that that city is definitely a place to stop off. Yeah, Amiens is famous. I mean, it's very famous, and the cathedral is very famous. All of that, you know. I I think I did a quick stop years ago when I was very young, but don't remember it. Another, see, there's so many places in France I need to go. <laughs> I feel badly. I need to go see all these places. Yeah, people ask me, you know, I usually end up, when I go to Europe, I go to France and Italy. I've never been to Spain, and I've been to Germany and Holland and Britain. And, I, you know, my next trip will probably be to Italy. And they said, well, why do you care? I said, because you can't, you, you can't see everything. You know, I, I'd rather do a deep dig into a couple of countries yeah. than to just touch a few. And, and, and from our last discussion and this one, you could see how, how, how much below the surface that you can get in these countries. And oh, it's just absolutely. So, and Especially it, if you're guided by locals, you can really yeah, that, get that into helps, family helps, life helps and all lot. that. Yep. Yeah. So the next day was a Tuesday. And, um, you know, at this point, you know, Thibaut realized that uh, for me, a lot of time in the car, I, 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 I stuck it out. I was good because I wanted to see everything, mm -hmm. but I had to deal with, you know, getting a headache and having being woozy. And I was using um, Advil's. Uh, mm. ibuprofen tablets, and I ran out. 
And I, ah. I never I never use them at home because I usually drive. And when you drive yourself, you don't get that. But when you're a passenger, you do. Yeah. So I asked if we could stop at a pharmacy to get some some ibuprofen. Yeah. And he said, can you wait till we get home? I said, why? He said, well, Christine has a ton of it because of your wonderful health care system. <laughs> she had the, the same dosage, only instead of a bottle, it was in capsules in a box. And mm-hmm. she put a bunch of it on the table. She said... <laughs> Take all you need. So I was able to <laughs> bring some home. So so it was a kind of a cute aside. So, so I told him, I, I said, uh, so he said, how about tomorrow we just take it easy and we stay close to home? I said, I said, well, when are you going to take me to see the farm? I want to see the farm. So that's what we did the next day. We went uh, to a town called Omblier, which is another small town up there. And that's where his second garden center is. Ah. And, and it's much like the first one, only they don't grow as much there. They grow most of the stuff in, in, in Flavie Le Mattel. And, but the store there was bigger. It was a more modern store. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we got to, I got to look, look at that one again. Mm-hmm. And then he took us to the family farm, and it's, it's quite extensive. And he grows wheat, sugar beets, and grapeseed. Grapeseed, I, I think it's, they use that for, to make canola oil. And, I call uh, um, it rapeseed, not grapeseed. Rapeseed, yeah. I think I think they 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 change it to to grapeseed because of what rapeseed sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know, that's but that's that's point. what it's that's, a good that's point. what it's that's what it's used for. Mm-hmm. And and I found out that canola was uh, I think it was discovered in Canada, and it's like it's short for Canada or Canadian oil. Mm. So, and it's it supposedly has a, a very high. Um, uh, heat level so you could fry it's very good for frying and it's 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 um it's not as um uh, as as not so good for you as some some of the more saturated fat oils mm-hmm. so he, so he grows those three crops the sugar beets i wasn't familiar with sugar beets but he sells a lot of the sugar beets to sugar companies that manufacture sugar mm-hmm. and when when paul was here the first day I take the kids to a supermarket and right off the bat found out that Paul was a vanilla holic like I am. We love the flavor of vanilla, vanilla <laughs> ice cream, vanilla cookies, vanilla everything. When he saw vanilla Oreos, he, the, the kid was ecstatic. Uh. And every once in a while, I, I, I pay $5 for a box of vanilla Oreos and I pay $12 to ship them to him in France. Oh, jeez. So but um, uh, his... So his father, uh, he, he showed us a bag of, um, of vanilla sugar from a company that he sells the vanilla to. In fact, they, they, it was my birthday in early June, and they had prepared a little bag of a birthday things for me. And one of them was a bag of the, the vanilla sugar, which I just finished using up. I used it in my coffee. So it was very nice. Nice. And not, not being from the Midwest, I never really saw wheat fields before. And so ah. I got to see the wheat. And I took a very close-up picture of one. It's a very, very beautiful crop. And oh yeah, it's it's nice when it kind of they dance in the wind. They're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was my my first real experience to to, to see a farm. And and uh, Paul dad was explaining a lot of different things to me. And they were they were in a period of, of of very little rainfall up there. So I was concerned about the dryness of of, of the soil and. You know the different factors that they have to deal with. Then we went to the um, the old family house, and uh, uh, that they the family used to have his Paul's grandparents sold the house a few decades back, but they lived next to it in a smaller compound. And the house is is looks like a small chateau, a very small chateau, but very very nice. And and Paul says, yeah, he said that used to be the family the family house. <laughs> and so look, you look at it, it like, look, looks amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they just don't need all the room. You know, as the family grew up and grew out, they uh, they didn't need the the space. And but his grandparents live right next to that, so we visited them. And his grandmother was putting up strawberry and currant preserves, so she had a table full of those. Uh-huh. So she made sure we left with a couple of jars of that. And I have them on my on my last jar now that I'm protecting with all my life. Uh oh. <laughs> well, and you're then, lucky you didn't forget to put it in your checked but luggage. Oh no, no. I, I I learned that I learned that oh. on a previous previous trip to France when I bought yeah. vanilla at at, at GD2. I bought this. The French vanilla is the the, the vanilla extract. Mm-hmm. It's so much better than what we get here in the U.S. Oh, that's and funny because I buy my vanilla in America. <laughs> 
<laughs> see, but here it has it has too much of a liquor flavor, ah, and yes. and I I um I, I put it in a carry on, and when I checked in, we were there on a on a cooking a, a chocolate and wine tour, and when I went through the the security, these two young women. They asked me if I had medicine in the bag. I said no. And then they opened the bag. They took everything out. And they held up this little bottle of vanilla and had a big smile on their face. So I go, oh, no, they're going to confiscate my vanilla. But they let me keep it. They let me keep it. Nice. So I was, I was, I was very That's happy about that. That's good because I've had stuff thrown out before. So Yeah, so I learned. So I, I made sure yeah. that this went uh, yeah. in the um, – in the in the in the check Shed bag. Nugget. Yeah. <laughs> so then one other experience that we had that took me out of my comfort zone was we had uh, Paul's dad drives a Peugeot. Yeah. And yeah. and there was his grandfather had a Peugeot and in, in one of the yards where they have all of their harvesting equipment they have um, um, they have a big John Deere tractor that uh, harvester that um, Paul's dad was very proud of but there were two big blue one big blue tractor out on the on the uh, on the yard. And it was be- kind of between the two, where the two Peugeots were parked. And Paul's dad looked at me and said, you want to drive the tractor? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, because I looked at the cars and figured, you know, how many, can I take out both cars at the same time with this, <laughs> this machine? And he said, oh, come on. So we got up in the tractor. And I know how to drive a, a, a standard, a manual. So I kind of had a good idea of what I needed to do. Plus he was right there next to me so he could reach over and do anything if I was going to get into trouble. So I did a big circle in the tractor and that was nice. So I got that experience. <laughs> then he looked at my partner who has no experience with, with anything except an automatic car. Mm-hmm. It's not, not very, you know, into, into machines. And he said, it's your turn. So <laughs> I got up and I, I held my breath and I took a video and he, he, he did, Hey, Paul says, you know, he, he's driving much slowly. I said, yeah, but let him drive slowly. The Peugeots will be protected that way. So, so I had that experience, which was which was really nice. So that was the um, that was the last night we were we were there. We were leaving the next day, which was a Wednesday. And I had asked Thibault and Christine, Paul's folks, that um, um, I, I said, you know, we really would like since she made all the meals. I said, would you? We would really like to take you out to dinner, you know, pick mm-hmm. out a favorite restaurant. We really want to take you out. We insist to take you out. So they took us to a town uh, near um, where they live called Saint Quentin. It's a little Saint- bit of a bigger- Saint Quentin. Saint Quentin, yeah. Cause, yes. Cause it, took me a while, it took me a while when I started seeing the signs and listening to them say Saint Quentin that it, we would say in English Saint Quentin. <laughs> and that's where um, Paul's sister goes to high school. Ah goes to boarding school there. And um, it's amazing. She's 16 years old, only spoke English in English class at school, and she spoke the best English uh, of, of almost all of them. Oh. And it was so impressive. And she, she impressed herself. She didn't realize. And she was getting the verb tenses correct. Her vocabulary was good. Uh, so she's, she's, got, she's gotten a good English education. That's so good. We, that, that's unusual. School. Yeah, we got to see the school where, 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 she, where she went. And um, the uh, Paul's dad and the, the nurseries, they sell the flowers uh, to local municipalities that they put in the public areas of the towns. So when we would visit towns like, like St. Quentin, they, he showed us the flower beds and he said, those are my flowers. Those are my flowers. So they help the, the towns with the design and then the towns make the purchases. So that's, that's a big part of his business. So it was interesting to, to, to see that and how he, mm. how he put, cast a critical eye on, on how things were, were growing. Yeah. <laughs> We had dinner at a restaurant called Le Dito, L apostrophe E D I T O. I have yep. no idea what that means. The editorial. And, oh, okay. Yeah, because I think it had like a typewriter or, or a, a key yeah. in the as, a, as their logo. So it was, it was uh, they had a big dining area on the main square of the town. Hmm. And, and to me, the restaurant seemed like an eclectic American restaurant. I think what Paul's folks did is that instead of picking a restaurant, that they would have liked, they thought of one that they probably thought we would. That have you liked. would have liked, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like that when I go to France, I want to experience France. France. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so well, they. I think, yeah. I, I think these are the. But I did find mussels on the on the menu, like like Donnie had uh, had uh, uh, fajitas, which is a big uh, Tex-Mex dish over here. Mm-hmm. It's, 
expect to see over there. And they had hamburgers and, and things like that. So <laughs> oh, I there's had, more and more of that in France anyway. So I had a big, big helping of mussels and they had a good selection of craft beer. So I had one that had a pig's face on it. It was called Rince Cochon, uh, which I don't yeah. know what Cochon means pig, but the R-I-N-C-E, I didn't know what, what that means. Rince Cochon? That yeah. means... <laughs> It's um, a, it's a, it's a pig rinse. It's um, so it's if okay, you rinse, okay. you rinse if you wash your beer. pig off, then what's you, left is that. Beer. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's, it's a big it's laughing a funny pig. name. Right? And I, I kind of had an idea that it was going to be something cute. I just I just couldn't, and and uh, I don't know if Paul's dad tried to explain it, but if he did, I didn't understand him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the water left after you rinse the pig. <laughs> It was, it was nice because was, I was on last night with them and, and I was sitting across from Paul's dad and a really nice conversation with him. And, and again, he just brought up what a great time Paul had, that it was an unforgettable, unforgettable trip for him mm-hmm. that when he was in New York and how, how great it was, you know, everything I did. And I, you know, I just, I just was a tour guide and, and a gracious host. Yeah. And, and, um, and I said, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, sometimes I, I don't know if it, if it would be better if the kids stayed in a house with family, although I take them to a friend's house who has, who has two teenage, a teenage boy and girl yeah. to spend time with them so they can see the all American family. And Paul said, tell me, he says, no, he says, it's probably better with you because you had the time and the, and the, and the energy to be able to take them to different right. places to spend, and spend you know, like, well, uh, on one time. Right. And you know, also, if you have teenagers and you bring in somebody from another country, they might get along, but they might not. And then it's really awkward. Yeah. Well, I, so, when I, I, I experienced this year, I had a boy from Marseille and one of his, he had, he had met another, another boy who lives in Marseille. They became good friends. And I took them both to a water park one, one Sunday. And when I picked up the other boy, the woman who hosted him had a Russian boy in the house because they won't put two of the same nationality if you host two of them because they want okay. them to speak English. And she had two young ones of her own. And in talking to the other boy, it was like, well, you know, she's spending a lot of time. There's four kids and she's a single mom. So her attention was divided four different ways. Yeah. But the kids are with me. They're, they're, they're the star attraction. They're the, yeah, they're, yeah, they're the yeah. So. so I want to ask you um, about the food differences between Corsica and Picardy, because I'm assuming it's going to be quite different. Well, I, you know, the traditional Corsican food, it, it, to me, was almost like uh, like a, a, a version of Italian food. Yeah. Where in, in Picardy, the food was um, uh, it was just more more traditional for more uh, just just regular food. We would have uh, yeah. sausage. They grilled sausage one night. We would have uh, roasted chicken. Yeah. Um, pork. Uh, things like that. So it wasn't anything. I didn't, to me, it was it was typical. I I, I find that that that. People, I, I don't make a generalization. I don't think that 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 the, the families I was, I don't think they did eat out that much, that they right. go to restaurants that much. Years ago, I had gone to the birthplace of my grandparents in in northern Italy in in Asti, mm-hmm. and we were went out looking for restaurants, and there were few and far between. And somebody finally told us that the people we we eat at home, we don't really don't eat out, and it wasn't yes. a tourist. It wasn't a tourist town, so exactly. there weren't a lot of restaurants. And I think up where Paul is in Picardy is the same kind of thing because they took us a couple of towns away to go to the restaurant. I said, well, how about here in the town? And they just shook their heads like there was nothing. Yeah, there isn't one. Yeah, it's the same and, where I live. We don't – I mean, we have now a little restaurant that opens that I keep threatening to go try. I haven't done it yet. Uh, but it's they mostly serve lunchtime for people who work in the area that need a place to go to lunch. But that's it. You know, people don't go out that much. So we have in the big city in Toulouse, we have several that we can choose, lost we can choose from. But as soon as you get out of the city, there's not that much. You see, and when I was younger, going back into the 50s and 60s, I, I, don't, I think I was a teenager before I ever ate in a restaurant. We never, I mean, the, the, and, I, and I grew up in a oh. part of New York City in Staten Island that was separated from the city. So it, it, it wasn't a touristy place. And and the, you know the the restaurants were very very few and far between. So I think so it's almost America the same has kind changed. of yeah. Oh yeah yeah. So it's almost, I think it's almost the same kind of culture there that that they they're more to eat at home and, and on very very special occasions will probably eat in a restaurant because yeah. it was just just like 
it was not even seemed to me like it was even thought of because we were prepared and we really wanted to take them out to eat. I just think I figured it was enough of a burden that we were imposing on their home that now they have to cook for us. Mm-hmm. You know, just like the breakfast, the breakfast in both places was basically coffee and and some breads uh, like the, uh, the the baguettes. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they would go out and buy croissant and, and uh, of course, the strawberries, the fruits and cheese, mm-hmm. yogurt. Uh, in, in both places was 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 like that. So, yeah. uh, I think you know, really, really can't see much of a difference. But the cuisine, of course, if you go to the traditional cuisine, would be I guess would be different because it's more regional. Yeah. But uh, but but Picardy, I didn't really notice that the food was different, much different than from what I eat here. Mm-hmm. Except that it was fresher, and uh, the fruits, vegetables, and meats in France and Italy are just so much better because they're 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 or, or either organic or they're raised better. Yeah, and, well, and the, who knows? the fruits and vegetables are, uh, it's almost a religion that they're only eaten in season, which mm-hmm. some of us are just starting to get to, into here in the United States. Like Donnie will eat a tomato in January and the tomato was tasteless and it's pale pink. Yeah. Uh, and our Jersey tomatoes come out from July to October and I eat them till I come out of my ears, but I won't eat them the rest of the year. Yeah. So. So that's what I learned in the Master Gardener program about eating fruits and vegetables in season. And it seems like that's just the way it's done in, in Pretty France. Pretty much. I mean, you can still find tomatoes in the grocery store year round, but they're not very good. And you <laughs> they come from Israel. In... They come from somewhere exactly, far. Exactly. Exactly. And they're only there. I mean, if you have to have a tomato, it's more like a decorative element right. at that point. Right. You know, you just slice a few tomatoes to look good, but you don't. That's yeah, not the not, main occasion. It's something else on the dish that's interesting. Not for flavor. And and the next day we, they took us back to Charles de Gaulle, uh, Paul and his dad. And just like Luca and his dad in in in, uh, in Bastia, they insisted on parking the car. See here, when we take people back to the airport, we drop them off at yes. the at, at the at the front of the airport because parking is expensive as it as it is in Charles de Gaulle and. They're going to be at the airport for a few hours because they have to go through security and all this anyway. Yeah. And and then we take off. And I I all I said just just drop us off. But no, they insisted to park the car, <laughs> walk us, and make sure that we were checked in. And we had a little bit of a glitch at Charles de Gaulle, so it was good that Paul's dad was there because he was able to intervene and get get it taken care of. We got in the wrong line, mm-hmm. so he was able to figure out what, what was the correct line. So had he not been there, it would have it would have caused us a little bit of a problem that we could have figured out, but it would have taken us some time. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, just it just it just put an exclamation point on their hospitality that they wanted to make sure that that everything that they could possibly do they did for us, and that we were going to get off uh, and and in, in, their, in their very good hands. And yeah, that's very nice. I, again, the, the sweetest, most most wonderful people, and and. You know, you get on the plane and 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 the, and now you start to go back into reality and, and and like when 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 Luca went back to Corsica from here, his dad wrote me that he looks at your picture and Donnie's picture and he cries and he thinks it was a dream that it never happened. And I'm on the plane Aww. flying back across the Atlantic to to New Jersey and I'm thinking, you know, did this really happen? Did I really wow. meet you? you know, not so much that the places were wonderful and the history and the beauty, but that the people were genuinely. They just opened their arms, opened their homes, and it was anything I can do for you, just tell me. And they, they, they just so genuine about it. So anytime I hear Americans who have never met a French person say, I don't like the French, you know, I, I just I, I just want to get violent. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> because, but it's because, but it's annoying. Because I know I know I know what what French people are and they're they're very, very wonderful. Mm-hmm. And you know, you had in this case you really had a very untypical experience with a, a, a family that's close to the terroir. You know, they, I mean, they're farmers, so th- it's a very rural situation. I mm-hmm. would think that most people who come to France, unless they come to visit family or friends or some, some something like you, they won't experience that. But that's real France. That's real life. In France. Oh, it's just like me. Ask me how many farms I've been to in the United States. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. who goes to farm but but the fact that i have an interest in that in horticulture and that that i had this opportunity made it better 
but even that that part of France has the World War One history, the Champagne. That, you know, there are things to to see and do there. Right, but uh, it's not the it's not super touristy. I mean, honestly, it's no, not. no, 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 not a, not at all. Not if you have two weeks a year to go on vacation, you're going to go to places that that have more more to to offer you. Yeah. But uh, but but just to have the experience of being right. with these people and and feeling like you're part of their family, it, it was just a, it was a just an unforgettable experience. thing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was really interesting to me because I I found a lot of similarities to the to the farming families that I I know where I live, and it, you know fr France. I I'm always kind of in my mind looking for differences between places, but in this case, I found more similarities mm -hmm. than differences, even though it's on the other side of the country. So that's yeah, that but that, 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 that shows you that, that we're all people yeah. and we all, we're all, we're all cut from the same cloth pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And when we, when we can, I was on a, on a small ferry going to, um, going to Manhattan the other day and I, there was, there was some German tourists on the, on the ferry and I was trying to give them some help on, on where they were going. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to one of the men and he looked at me and he said, uh, he says, we are very afraid of your president. And I looked at him and I said, so are we, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> so, you know, it's like you know, we're, we're people, you know, our governments are one thing, but our, the people are something else. Yeah. And, and there's also a lot of people who are excited about the new president, but I, I get the impression that most of the people who listen to this show were concerned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I don't know that. I, and it doesn't matter to me, but, um, but it's, it's true. You, you, the real people have, you know, it's different than I think you, you make that connection person to person and, and, and the, the borders, and, you know, they, 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 they sink away. You know, you're, you're one person talking to another person mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a wonderful experience. All right. Well, thank you so much again, William. You have been extremely helpful and maybe tell us again, the name of that uh, association that you, that you help out with the students. It's, it's called education first. They do programs in the United States in Orlando, Boston, New York, New Jersey, and I think Los Angeles. Okay. And they bring kids in from three weeks to four weeks uh, every every summer from June to the end of August. And if you just look up education first, um, they're always looking for host families. And I and and, and people are, are reluctant to to do it because you know it's a, it's a little bit of a commitment. Yeah. But I tell you, I've, it's four times now, and it's four four times. It's it's <laughs> it's been the greatest experience of my lifetime. So. And so pretty much they they they're away like morning for school and yeah, the they're, they're, yeah they you, they the bus picks them up from a bus stop. Um, they do a school bus circuit. Usually they're gone from eight thirty to six thirty. So they're, they're Monday to oh. Friday. So you have them at night, and you have them on, you know, on the weekends, and 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 basically they you, they you just you feed them three meals a day. You pack a lunch for them. Mm -hmm. They give you a one hundred dollar a week stipend to help with the food, mm -hmm. and then they just basically want them to share in the culture and the activities of your family. Mm -hmm. I go above and beyond because I'm able to do it and I have the time to do it. Yeah. And I love I love to show off New York. So if you come to New York, let me know. And I will take you anywhere in the city. I absolutely love to show oh, off the I will, city. I will and, definitely and, take you up on that. <laughs> and and, and, and you know, when these kids come and I take them on the circle line around Manhattan, it's like it's like a, a kid's face on Christmas morning when they open up a package. And that to yeah. me is priceless. Yeah. To see them experience the, the the depth of this city, and that I'm I'm presenting it to them to take them to the top of the World Trade Center and things like that, it, it's it's everything to me. I I I can't wait till next August to to do it again. That's wonderful. So, All right, William, I'm gonna let you go because you've been very patient and talking for a long time, and I'm sh I'm sure your voice is sore. I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, thank you, Annie. I never, I love your podcast. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you, Pamela Carpenter, John Little, Chuck Bonafante, and Brownwyn Harris for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. And my thanks to all the other patrons who support the show month after month. Thank you for giving back. To support the show on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And thank you so much for doing that. I'm at 143 patrons today. That's a lot of people who appreciate what I do. 
Would you buy me a coffee if we met in real life? Donating as little as $2 per month is the same thing, and I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Kathleen Wall, for setting up a recurring donation via PayPal. You don't have to use Patreon if you don't want to. Look for the green button on any episode page that says tip your guide. And thank you, Verla Hubert, for your generous one-time donation. Thank you so much for giving back. Elise came over to my house this week to record a couple of episodes that you'll hear in the weeks to come. And of course, we talked about this whole protest thing and uh, the gilets jaunes, as uh, they call themselves. And so let me play that for you right now, because it is stuff that you need to keep in mind. And it, uh, it is true, not just for this protest, but for any sort of protest that you'll encounter in France. French people are the protesting kind. So there you have it. All right, Elise, since I got you here, let's talk about the gilet jaune just a little bit. Okay. We both had uh, interesting experiences uh, last Saturday. You were in Toulouse, I was in Paris. Right. B but what's in, what I want to put across to the listeners is that this is just a temporary thing. Right. It's probably going to resolve in the next few weeks, although... <laughs> anybody's guess yeah. is, uh, you know. Uh, also, um, this is a really fleeting kind of situation. So we can't tell you if there's going to be a demonstration. Or where. Uh, or where, or if, if right. It, 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 the difference, of course, is if you're in a big city like Paris, it's there's a lot more territory to cover, even though they're concentrating in certain places. Um, I, I think the um, it, it's if you're in Paris, there's far more of a chance that you can avoid dealing with it as a situation because the city is so big and they're only in very specific small places. Right. Uh, even though they are moving around, I mean, it's a situation that's uh, kind of it's volatile in the sense that nobody knows where they're going to go right. uh, uh, from time to time. But uh, uh, if you're in a smaller city, in this case for me, uh, being in Toulouse, there is only one little old city center. And if there's going to be a demonstration, unfortunately, it does block a lot more of what's going on in terms of transportation and places to go. Right. Although I have to admit that in spite of having gotten caught up in the center of things Saturday night, once I left and went six blocks away, it was, there was nothing. Yeah. And people were out having a drink on Saturday night, and it was like And it was fine. Was, like and everything was even. fine. Right. right. This is the problem. And I realized after, so on Saturday morning, my niece and I went around and did several things. First thing we did is, uh, that's interesting to you guys, is that we took the bus to go to the Quai Branly Museum, mm -hmm. and the bus all of a sudden stopped and said, I'm not going any further because of the demonstrations, right. and everybody had to get off. That happened to be right in front of the Louvre. Everything looked fine to us. We couldn't see or hear anything. So we went about our business. We went on walking around uh, uh, Palais Royal and all of that, and then, because we were waiting for either another bus to go to Kivoli or, or Metro, or we decided, well, we could walk there, I guess. I, we went to a cafe. Anyway, n normal stuff. And then uh, we decided to go inside of the Louvre because my niece hadn't been there for years, and I didn't realize that. So I took her, and we, went, and we had a good time. But while this was happening... They were there were big problems uh, at the Christmas market and uh, Place de la Concorde, which we saw nothing of. You saw nothing of. Oh. Right. Then we went to the Grand Boulevard, which are just Where walking distance. By the time we left, they had to lock them down and evacuate. Uh, but we didn't... I mean, we could see black smoke in the distance, but it was like half a kilometer away, so I just knew if we walk in the other direction, we'll be fine. Um, and then we went to the covered passages, and again, as soon as we left, they closed, they them, closed down. them down. So it, we were lucky, but I guess what you need to realize is that there are no guarantees that you will or will not run into problems. Right. I, I think it's, uh, well, it's kind of unfortunate because I'm sure a lot of people are coming here for the Christmas season, and uh, I'm walking around parts of Paris, but, but it is true that it's a, um, it's a kind of civil 
unrest that is very unfamiliar to Americans mm -hmm. and that is very common in France, although right. it doesn't usually degenerate into a situation with tear gas and, and police confrontation, but it's very mobile. And uh, it is true that we don't know, for instance, if there's going to be this same kind of thing next Saturday or not, or right. if they're going to do something else. Uh, it changes all the time. and it, They don't know, probably. They don't know. Well, of course, now that there's an, a, finally, as of yesterday, an attempt on the part of the government to calm things down right. seriously, uh, there probably will not be as big a demonstration uh, the next right. one. Or if it is, it will be more peaceful in general because there's been a there's been a call by most of the people who are the moderate people involved in this to either not demonstrate Saturday or to demonstrate peacefully and stop all of the, the confrontation right. with the police. Right. Uh, right. And another thing that happens in France that doesn't happen in other countries is that we have a lot of already established groups of people who demonstrate yes. over all sorts of things. Right. So we have unions, we have people who work for the railroad, people who work... Nurses, the, teachers. Right, they're all organized. Right. And so when something like this happens, it's very easy for them to say, hey, are we going to Paris this weekend? And when I was coming back from Paris on Sunday night, there was a whole group of people who work for the SNCF, so for the train, who... who They can travel for free, even. Mm -hmm, that's true. You know, so they just got on, and they're best buddies, and this is what they do. Like, they do this several times a year. They go protest mm -hmm. governments, and French governments, no matter, I mean, unless it's a socialist government, which we haven't had since Mitterrand and then Hollande, they tend to not have so many demonstrations against them. But if it's a centrist or right-wing government, you know there are going to be Just demonstrations, demonstrations constantly. Except It's that the big difference is that in most cases they're not violent. They're not violent, right? And this is this of is course different. The, this, this is, is different. the difference. Yeah. That this yeah. is this is it's a it's. I, I have to say, as a, as an American, even after living here for a long time, I have an idea of what's going on, but I would not say that I have a hundred percent clarity on the situation. And it's very, very, very complicated because something that started out as a kind of Uh, amorphous, uh, spontaneous thing through Facebook and uh, Twitter has and has no specific nominated leaders, which is different from the organized things that are run by professional groups or unions or things like that. Right. Um, I, I guess the way I feel about it is that the first reasons for the people going out to demonstrate were very clear and very specific. And the longer the government didn't try to dialogue directly with them, the more the it turned into pulling up every issue that has a, an, that's in a resentment of some kind or another, so that now mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to understand even what would make anybody happy oh, and anymore. It's you crazy know? because you, <clears throat> when you read in-depth reporting about this, so you have somebody who was at the root of this movement who's getting threatened right. by other people. Right. A guy from Toulouse. In, yeah. the, in, these, in this group because they resent the fact that he's been interviewed so yeah. many times. Anyway, it's a hornet's nest of, I don't know how they're going to fix it. Right. For you visitors, what you need to keep in mind is... If you see a demonstration, walk in the other direction. Right. And if there are disruptions to public transportation, plan on walking. So don't go so far. Like, sure, first thing in the morning on next Saturday or the Saturday after that, you will find trains to go to Versailles or whatever. But once you're there, you might not find a train back. So think about that. If it's a day where there are... Uh, protests going on, I would recommend you stay pretty close to your hotel, you know, walkable distance, a kilometer, two kilometers. Although you were in Paris, Annie, were the taxis running? We didn't try to take a taxi. Yeah. I think, I mean, the streets the taxis were probably blocked, run. right? Except no, no, for the streets were not blocked. Just a few streets around the Champs-Élysées yeah. and the, and the uh, Place de l'Étoile. And I in think. a case like that, you're better off with a taxi driver right. than with an Uber right. driver. Right. Because the Uber driver, it might be his second day on the job. And they won't know. And they won't know. A taxi driver who's been doing their, this for a long time, they know exactly what right. to do to avoid demonstrations. So if you're flying in on a day when there's uh, demonstrations or whatever... Yeah, the taxi. <laughs> Go to a taxi. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, I think... Unless it's a taxi that are protesting. If you have an app on your phone that can pull up local information, 
I think there's even information in English that will tell you basically what the, the most immediate yeah. situation is. France 24, so France yeah, 24, right. they broadcast in French, Arabic, and English, in English. and it's uh, real time. And it's and it's good because that way you can get an idea of what's going on. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, sometimes it's calmer in the morning. You don't know what's going on, and it can change later on in the afternoon. Yeah. But 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 just keeping in mind for people who are coming to Paris, that all of this took place in a very small part of the city. Right. And and the rest of the city, there was nothing. Right. If you were in Saint-Germain-des-Prés, you saw nothing. Nothing. Latin Quarter, nothing. you saw nothing. Uh, Montmartre, you saw nothing, actually. I yep. mean, down below, there was some stuff going on. But So it, it really is... It, you can be two or three blocks away and be fine. Right. The grand magasin, uh, so the department stores were a, a target, but we don't know who they're going to target. You right. know, so they were targeting uh, department stores, Champs Elysees, kind of luxury stuff. Right. So it's this good old uh, French feeling of resentment towards uh, wealthy people. Right. Which we've is has been a problem in France forever. I well, mean, I was going to say, know. this goes back to the revolution. You yeah, know I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so so we can't solve this. We no. can just say it's totally possible to avoid uh, getting caught in anything like that um, if, you just, if you're just a little bit aware of the situation, which is why we're talking about it. And if by some chance you're coming to France and you're going to go outside of Paris or outside of a couple of the other major cities, you'll be fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I live in a village. Uh, nothing. I mean, just, <laughs> nothing. It's just... You Strasbourg know. actually had a little bit of trouble, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Elise. You are welcome, Annie. Okay. If you enjoyed this episode, you should also check out episode 205 about World War I sites in France, and a lot of them are also in the Picardy. And as you know, because you are listening to me right now, you can hear Join Us in France anywhere you get your podcasts. But I appreciate all of you telling your friends and acquaintances about the show because it will help them plan their trip to France. Uh, tell them that they can listen on Pandora, Spotify, Alexa, Google Home, YouTube, and joinusinfrance.com as well. Or maybe you can find the Join Us in France page on Facebook and tag a friend uh, in a comment so they can see the episode that you think they need to look uh, to look at. And just a reminder, on Facebook, you cannot share posts that you see in the closed group. That's because they are it's a closed group. Nothing gets out. <laughs> so that's why I also put out uh, episode posts and promotions on the Facebook page for Join Us in France, because that you can share and you can tag people and all of that. And if you want to see the old episodes of the show, you can see all of them on joinusinfrance.com. And I encourage you to use the search button because I've carefully spelled out uh, names of all the places we've talked about. And some of them are pretty uh, uh, unknown. You know, by now we've talked about some little villages and you never know uh, when you are looking for information about a place in France, we might have talked about it. Maybe it was just in passing, but uh, we've talked about a lot of places in France. Show notes and photos for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 215. That's the number 215. And to connect with me, email Annie at joinusinfrance.com. And if you'd like to comment about something you enjoyed in France, if you'd like to have it featured on the show, leave a message at 1-801-806-1015. You don't need to do a whole episode. You could just call that number and leave some remarks about something or other that you found interesting or outrageous or that you want to recommend or not recommend or whatever the case may be. So that's 1-801-806-1015. And of course, you can also join the uh, Join Us in France closed group on Facebook. But when you do, answer all the questions. So I let you in. I'm a little bit prickly about that. Have a great week of trip planning and I'll talk to you next week. But remember, no episodes on December 30th or January 6th. Au revoir.
The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2018 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>